So today we're going to be taking a look at some of the Japanese naval preparations before the onset of the Second World War. We're going to be taking a brief look at some of the logistics, grand strategy, and some of the limitations that faced the Japanese. Now, looking at the history of the Japanese Navy, they were a fairly virgin imperial power, and the Navy had been a very effective means of achieving local goals. Now, the strategic aims of the Navy were always marred by several limitations, usually based off the lack of resources that the Japanese possessed. This was fairly obvious from some of their early engagements, such as their war against the Chinese Qing back in 1894, where they really couldn't afford the heavier German-made vessels, and it was seen when they were outnumbered by the Russian vessels in 1904 due to several structural industrial weaknesses within their state. Now, after World War I, you have a series of uh, arms limitation treaties that served as external limiters, which only complemented and compounded their other industrial issues. Now, the Washington and London treaties end up putting a ceiling on the number of capital and eventually other ships, including things like destroyers and whatnot. And even after the rearmament period, period in the 1930s, where Japan actually throws out a lot of these treaties, they still saw themselves as materially weak and as the underdogs uh, compared to the Western powers. And this would go on to influence their concept of naval doctrine. Now, Japan would eventually shift into a new strategic um, ideal for dealing with the Western powers, particularly against the Americans, the Interception Attrition Operations Dogma. Basically, their plan was, if war broke out, at the start of hostilities, their fleet was to destroy the American Asiatic fleet and then capture Luzon in the Philippines and the American territory of Guam, locking the U.S. out of the region. Submarines, meanwhile, would be used to stalk and attack the main American fleet in the eastern Pacific, buying time. Now, planes based in Micronesia, which are the holdings they earned after World War I, they took this area from Germany, they would use this to bombard the enemy as he came into range. They would then launch a, again, this is a pretty classic view of warfare, this massive force of destroyers, cruisers, and battleships would be launched usually in a night attack to finish off the fleet. That's the ideal. So this is a very defensive plan. It may seem ambitious compared to what Japan was operating on before, but it's really not that offensive of a plan. And it does give the opposing side, the Americans, the initiative in a war. This is purely a responsive dogma. Now, they were previously, as I would argue, arguing, um, dealing with a, uh, excuse me, a faulty theory of naval combat. And despite um, pretty intensive, crafty strategy from the Japanese Naval College, Japan was still a proponent of the classic model of naval combat, that is, direct action by cruisers and battleships. This is reinforced by their analysis of the World War I engagements at Jutland and at the Falkland Islands. Now, the Sino and Russo Japanese wars had been won via this traditional method, so the Japanese did, to their credit, have some precedent for this. Now, before World War II, it's worth noting that planes and submarines were really too simple, too crude to be truly used as an effective auxiliary units out in naval combat. Not to mention, even ships like destroyers were still pretty small, weren't too seaworthy, further lending credence to this idea of the traditional battleship model of warfare, as was seen throughout all naval history. Um, within re recent memory. Now, however, it's worth noting that improvements in tech in the 30s, in the 1930s, end up allowing better opportunity for such vessels to be used in a water wider role. And of course, they would be incorporated into further naval strategies. Now, the Japanese um, did eventually develop their naval air corps. However, the integration of air power and naval planning was really suppressed for many years for several reasons. After the Washington Naval Treaty, um, you know, amidst a lot of their economic decline in the 30s, the increments that really should have gone to them were repeatedly postponed. They had limitations on numerous vis uh, vessel production by the London Treaty, and this really forces the Japanese planners to look to air power as a means to supplement their declined fleet. Now, the 1930s did see impressive improvements to both aircraft and their ordinances, which would launch from carriers as the prime means of, of delivering this killing blow on the hostile fleet. Now, as of January 1937, Japan had cast off these limitation treaties, they had fortified Micronesia, and with the outbreak of war in China, which would escalate into a full-scale conflict by the fall, it saw a demonstration, demonstration of Japanese air power and the range of their new planes. And in 1938, they integrated their land and sea air units under one larger command, and by December of 1931, they had 3,300 aircraft and 10 carriers.
Now, eventually the Japanese uh, decided to supplement their classic war model with this idea of a surprise ambush being used at sea. Now, as early as 1927, there was already this idea of a surprise attack on Pearl Harbor. It had been utilized in map exercises at the Naval Staff College, which recommended in 1936 that if the enemy's principal ships, especially aircraft carriers, are at anchor at Pearl Harbor before the war, it is important to aim at opening hostilities by taking the enemy unawares with an air raid. Now, meanwhile, during this time, Japanese planners held the doctrine of outranging. They had this new Yamato-class warship, the Yamato and Musashi battleships. They had massive 18.1-inch guns with a range of 40,000 meters, easily outclassing even the European models. And, of course, there was the aircraft innovation of their Zeros, which had an effective range of 1,900 miles, far outreaching any other Allied aircraft at the time. Now, eventually the Japanese would eventually solidify their idea of necessity with war against the United States. And at the Imperial Conference held in 1940, the chief of the Naval General Staff, Nagano Osami, asserted that, that if the interception attrition strategy was correctly implemented and utilized, Japan could defeat the United States. Their chances were greater than 50%. Now, following the breakdown of diplomacy with the United States, being emboldened by German victories in 1940, Japan really felt that they had an honest chance of victory. Now, however, kind of at the last second, the, actually the year Pearl Harbor was bombed, um, Yamamoto Isoroku basically writes up this document called Comments on Armaments, where he ends up arguing against defensive posturing and traditional fleet versus fleet naval combat. He was a big supporter of what we had previously talked about, this idea of a devastating surprise assault on Pearl Harbor. This would deprive the Americans of their forward operating base and could knock them out of the war before they have a chance to, you know, shift their economy into motion and launch total war against the Japanese. These are the most important things to know about while studying the prelude to the Pacific War. And next time we will take a further look at how the Japanese war unfolds in the Pacific after they had conquered what they did in 1941 through 1942.